Hi, my name is Justin Selig, and I'm a product manager for the Cerebrus SDK. At Cerebrus, we built the Wafer Scale engine. It's the world's largest computer chip meant to provide cluster scale performance for AI and HPC. Our chip has 850,000 cores optimized for sparse linear algebra, 40 gigabytes of on chip memory, 20 petabytes per second of on chip memory bandwidth, and 220 petabits per second of fabric communication bandwidth. And it's built entirely on the latest seven nanometer process technology. To house the wafer scale engine, we built the CS2. It's a full system solution enabling you to run applications for both AI and high performance computing. We've designed the system from the ground up to power, cool, and feed data to our chip. And we've made it easy to install and deploy consuming one third the space of a standard data center rack. That system is programmed with our SDK or with common ML frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch. We've already enabled our users to leverage the CS2 using ML software, but now we're excited to announce that at the end of this year, we'll be releasing the first beta version of the Cerebrus SDK. The SDK will allow our developers to program at a more flexible, lower level directly for our architecture. And as part of the SDK, we'll be introducing a new domain specific programming language called CSL. That language will be familiar to most CRC++ developers already working on parallel program programming applications. To interact with the CS2, we're providing a set of simple Python APIs. And to make programming a more rich experience, we're including a set of libraries to handle common HPC primitives like collective communication and math functions. And for tools, we're providing the same tools that Cerebrus uses today for our own internal low-level development. So what's it like to program using the SDK? From the user's perspective, programming the SDK looks like most accelerators. You have a host, which loads programs onto the device, streams in and out data from worker CPUs, and reads or writes to device memory. The device can either be simulated in software or you can run on real CS2 hardware. On the device, you write one or more C-level programs using the CSL programming language, which target groups of cores on the chip. And the main execution style for the cores on the device is data flow programs. So when programming for data flow on the CS2 device, you'll write code for groups of cores, otherwise known as processing elements or PEs. There are up to 850,000 PEs arranged in a 2D grid that you can individually program with the SDK. To program each PE, there are three main concepts that you need to wrap your head around. The first is compute. Each PE contains a general purpose processor with optimized vector instructions and native data types, including FP32, FP16, and INT16. The second concept is communication. Each PE contains a programmable router which can be statically or dynamically configured to route data to neighboring PEs. Data is routed between uh, PEs in 32-bit packets, and these are known as wavelets. Those wavelets can move between adjacent PEs in just a single cycle. The last concept is memory. There's a total of 40 gigabytes of on-chip SRAM memory distributed across all the PEs. So each PE has access to 48 kilobytes of local memory containing both data and instruction memory and each read or write to local memory also takes just one cycle. When programming for the CS2 device, you'll leverage our new CSL programming language. CSL contains common constructs familiar to most developers and CSL specific constructs, which we'll cover. Most, most users who are familiar with CRC++ should be very, very uh, comfortable writing CSL. Two familiar concepts include types and functions. CSL is a statically typed programming language, and the upper left shows what it looks like to, to declare variables using our native data types like in 16 FP16, and FP32. Functions also look familiar with typical syntax you'd expect. And we also include language built-ins for accessing special compiler features like type checking or struct introspection. There are also common control structures like if, else, which, case, or while. Another familiar concept is the use of modules. Each CSL file acts as a module with its own namespace for variables, constants, and functions. 
and modules allow you to include one CSL file in another CSL file and invoke functions or refer to constants inside the imported module. In the example on the right, one CSL module m1.csl is being imported twice into another CS module m2.csl and m2 is calling an increment function on both those modules. Modules can also be used to import libraries to handle functionality like collective communication across PEs. Unique to CSL is the concept of a task. Tasks are special functions used to implement data flow programs. And as the programmer, you'll bind tasks to routes, also known as colors, so that when data arrives on a particular color, the associated task is executed, almost like an interrupt. We introduce the concept of data structure descriptors or DSDs as well. DSDs allow you to run vector instructions as threads where the operands point to tensors of data. And DSDs also allow you to communicate data to and from the router to talk to neighboring PEs. On the right, we show an example of using a DSD to send the value 42 out of the PE using color zero. Let's now walk through the steps of writing a, a, a program using the SDK. As you might expect, first you compose a host Python program and a device CSL program. In the host program, you'll define what the data should be sent to or received from the device. Then you'll compile your device code through the CSL compiler to generate a binary. And last, you'll use the, Hypo, you'll use the, uh, the host Python program to load the binary onto the CS2 or the software simulator. And when execution is completed, you'll read back the output data from the host to proceed with your application code. Let's dive more deeply into an example using a command line program. All right, so in this example, we'll run a program on one PE of a simulated CS2 device. As the programmer, you'll write two programs, one for the host called host.py and one for the device called device.csl. In device.csl, we have two blocks down here, which get executed before runtime. In the layout block, we're defining what code will run on which PEs, and we're also reserving PEs to run code on. In this case, we have a call to set rectangle, which is reser reserving a rectangle of size one by one. And on the x equals zero, y equals zero location of that rectangle, we're placing the device.csl code, which is the current, co uh, the current code file. In the comp time block, we are associating the main task defined here with a color identifier for that task. And we're activating that color such that this task will get uh, will get uh, will, will run at at, uh, at runtime. In this main task, we are assigning a global variable the value of forty two. And so, when we are finished with this program, we'll load this global variable to make sure that the the program executed correctly. So now we'll compile our program called device.csl with the CSL compiler called CSLC. As arguments, CSLC takes in the top level CSL file, followed by the dimensions of the simulated fabric. In this case, we're simulating a single PE, so we only have one by one. And we take in the offset of where we want to simulate our code. In this case, we want to simulate our code on the upper left-hand corner of this simulated fabric, so we pass in 0, 0. If compilation is successful, you'll see compile successful printed out. And after compilation, you have a binary generated for each PE on the fabric. In this case, the binary is for location 0, 0, and it's in the ELF format. Now let's take a look at the host code. In our host.py program, we specify the path to our ELF binary, and we also specify the path to a core file that we want the simulator to write to. We then use a helper class called CSELF runner, which takes in the path to the ELF binaries. And then we call a function called uh, run on sim fabric using the name of the core path to produce a core file uh, as an output from the simulator. We then use this ELF inspector class to read the result of what happened during simulation. In this case, we pass in the binary path as well as the core path. 
And then we use this helper function called get as array to read out the global variable that was defined in the CSL code. That global variable has type int 16, and we're using NumPy types here. At the end of our program, we compare the result of our program to a reference value of 42. And if this runs correctly, then this should just pass. So let's test that out now. When I run python host.py, it'll spin up the simulator and it will run our code feeding in the inputs and reading out the outputs. And we see that our program has run correctly and it printed out the result is 42. And so that's how you run a simple program on one PE of a CS2 or simulated CS2. So thanks for listening. Uh, if you're interested in learning more or getting your hands on the SDK, we ask that you reach out, reach out to us at cerebrus.net slash SDK. We'd love to collaborate on any exciting applications for the CS2 that you can think of. Yeah.